Yes, yes, yes. Okay, one second. No, it says cannot load link. Yeah, it says it cannot load link actually. Okay, so can I start then? Hello everyone. So uh, today we'll be starting with this particular class uh, on you know current affairs. Good morning, everyone. I hope everyone can hear as well as see me, right? Oh, just give me a second, please. So uh, today, from today, we'll be starting a course on you know current affairs. Uh, what we'll be doing is, so we'll be covering the current affairs from you know, from uh, of January month. So we'll be covering the complete current affairs which were covered in the month of January. In ten days, so we'll be covering the current affairs in ten days. So where the course will be like this from first of February from to nineteenth of February, we'll be covering the complete current affairs. of the january month okay so this will be in 10 days and daily we'll be covering this particular course in one hour so we'll be starting from today and we'll be continuing like that till session number 10 of 19th february 2019 so in these 10 days we'll be finishing off our complete current affairs for the month of january
I hope everyone can hear as well as see me right. So if that's fine, we'll start. Just let me know. Yes. So, so from today, uh, yeah. So thanks, thank you for that. So, so we'll be covering the month of the January current affairs completely in these ten days. So in ten hours, you will, you can complete the complete current affairs for the month of January. Okay. So that is the main objective for this particular course on the current affairs. So, we'll be starting. Yeah, I'm starting. I'm starting. I'm starting. Yeah. So I just need some confirmation that everyone is fine, right? So because I don't want any kind of issues in the middle, so I just want to confirm the same, right? Yeah. So uh, daily you can find these kind of courses on an academy, uh, particularly like you know. Uh, please, uh, in case if you have not downloaded the an academy learning app, you can download that and you can see different kind of courses like that, and there are many live courses too. Okay, so. Today we will be starting with the first lesson of our course on current affairs. So generally, uh, you know, India has a huge potential in different kind of concepts, like you know, be it with respect to the production of different kind of things. At the same time, we have been, you know, we have been looking towards the manufacturing of this. Now, at the same time, now we need some kind of, you know, market about our products in the different countries, isn't it? So when we produce that and we keep using them in India, will that be sufficient? Definitely not, right? So we have to. we have to promote them in the abroad like we have to make other countries as a market so we have to develop that much better right so what is the purpose so now firstly we'll be starting with something called an export promotion council so what exactly is an export promotion council so that is good till now you know we have been manufacturing different kind of things but as i said we need a market for that so for that particular purpose we need to create a situation in other countries right so in order to create that kind of situation a positive thing a positive thing for the market of india we need to create that in other countries and that will be done by this export promotion council okay so export promotion councils will be the non profit organizations but they will be getting the support from the government of india okay so now what is the purpose of this particular export promotion councils so there is a purpose for that so as we are manufacturing the different kind of things now we need to create a brand right so like if you look into the different kind of products that are present in the market so you definitely choose the better one isn't it so now if, if for example let's take in india itself we have the products from different brands so definitely people often choose the uh, the product with you know much higher quality and quantity isn't it so in that way it is it will be so when we are choosing this kind of brands it must be you know very efficient one so that will be through you know when we have better image for the brand only then it can be done so that will be done by the export promotion council which will create a brand for the country okay so that is done by the export promotion councils so they make the products to create a kind of brand about indian products in other countries but the other thing is necessary is that we must also maintain some international standards isn't it if we don't maintain the standards and we and we want our products to be promoted can it be done no it cannot be done right so it will also focus on promotion of this international standards too okay it will promote the international standards as, as make it sure that the products which we are exporting are up to the standards at international market and moreover now we cannot say that you know all the products that are being manufactured or all the products that are being sold in other countries have to be you know so uh, like you know it has to be produced by, even by the private companies so it will help the private companies and provide them such kind of support so that you know they provide the pro the create such a products which are you know having a better market and which will create a brand for india only then you know we we have been saying about make in india for the past few months right so when can this be a successful if we can have a better market in abroad only then it can be successful isn't it so now when we want to create a market abroad we need 
some kind of brand and that will be done by the export promotion council and how will it do it so this will focus on creation of the brand by you know making the international quality standards are being followed in the country and after doing following the international standards it will also make sure that so this particular standards have you know as per the international level and moreover it will attract the investors by conducting some kind of you know exhibitions and trade you know trade trade fairs as well as some kind of you know meetings between the buyers as well as sellers right so why are we talking about this today export promotion council this is not a new concept but why are we talking about this today what is it relevance to the current affairs there is the relevance to that that is recently the ministry of msme has created the first ever export promotion council till now the ministry of msme that is micro small and medium enterprises doesn't have any kind of export promotion council and the for the first time they have created this now india has a huge potential we have different kind of handloom sector we have many micro small and medium enterprises right so we need to create a market for this so this particular export promotion council of the msme ministry will create you know uh, will see that you know how well are the indian industries are ready to export the products that is nothing but following of the international standards right so when we can follow these international standards we can create a market for them so that will be done by this particular you know msme ministry particularly the export promotion council and you know if we can if we can produce the different kind of products and we keep if we keep on exporting them will that be sufficient definitely not what it needs it needs some kind of you know areas which are we strong in uh, let me tell you like if i if i export whatever the product i you know i manufacture definitely that will not be efficient so in order to be efficient we must make it sure that this particular product this particular product is required by those people if we don't know the requirement of the people and if we keep on supply our products to the other countries definitely that will not be sufficient at all isn't it so that is the main area we will focus on identifying the areas which we need this kind of support and we'll make it sure that the indian indian msmes industries are collaborating with the different countries and see that we have a particular market and the objective of this is that they want to create a target of about 100 billion of exports by the year 2020 hope it is clear if there is any doubt you can let me know now so this will be having a governing council so this governing council will be headed by the secretary of the ministry of micro small and medium enterprises so whatever the benefits or whatever the functioning that is going on it will be looking into that particular aspect and the members of this particular council will include not just the members not just the officials from the msme ministry but also the officials from the commerce as well as you know msme export promotion councils these are the you know msme export promotion councils and some export development authorities all will be a part of this okay so that is about the export promotion council of msme moving further so now i think many of you might be engineers right yeah so i hope that is clear right everyone can see and hear me right just let me know yeah so okay that's cool then so now so the way the engineering colleges are working on in the country as of now you know is not up to the mark when when iits were established in the country right after the independence they were established with a great objective to promote the engineering education and to promote the technology in the country but that has led for creation of different kind of engineering colleges and the problem now is that and the problem now is that you know we don't have 
many kind of engineer uh, any engineering colleges i i doesn't mean that you know not all engineering colleges doesn't have any standard but many engineering colleges in the country are now you know not getting uh, filled because of you know the seat for example if we say that you know a branch called computer science and engineering has been allocated 120 seats in a particular college the situation has changed earlier people used to compete a lot to get this 120 seats but that is not the situation where now you know we cannot even see 60 seats are being filled out of this 120 that has become the situation now okay so recently government of india has appointed a committee so it has done some kind of research on that about the different kind of opportunities we have and what exactly happened with respect to the seats filling and all so it says that more than half of the engineering seats that were allocated are falling vacant every year and when you look into the occupancy the occupancy of the engineering streams is 60% and the industry is able to use only 40% of those particular people who are working from this particular 60% getting it if you say you know if you see that is you know if there are 100 seats that are allocated yeah there are some issues like that yes amar so the problem is here you know the problem is not just with respect to the education standards but also the infrastructure that is present in the colleges you know there are different kind of engineering colleges but we are unable to you know we are unable to create uh, such a kind of infrastructure and we are unable to have some collaborations with the industries like for example if we talk about the computer science and engineering there are many almost every engineering college in the country now have the computer science and engineering as a branch as a stream but how many of these colleges have linkages with the with the respective industries you know that remains a problem so it says that in the year 2016-17 there were about 15.5 lakh engineering seats in 3291 colleges across the country and of this only 51% have been like you know uh, like 51% of these seats were not taken at all only 49% of the seats were filled now what is the problem here the problem is with respect to the infrastructure with respect to the labs and faculty the problem with the faculty okay so we don't have proper ecosystem so all these are the problems so we have recently they have submitted the report to the all india council for technical education and they have given some great changes for this they have given some better recommendations you know the problem in indian education system is sometimes with respect to you know updating of the knowledge you know which is very much essential when you talk about the aspect when you talk about the aspect of uh, you know technology in particular now even if you see like you know when the computer science and engineering has been started they have they have been dealing with you know c language c++ and so and so so program programming languages and even now they are continuing with the same and the problem is now we have many updating technologies such as you know internet of things we have blockchain we have these many kind of things one second one second i'm sorry so we have these many kind of things but it is not you know that is a problem like we are unable to implement them so for that particular purpose this committee has given some wonderful recommendations it says that you know we need not set up any new engineering colleges from 2020 rather than that rather than that let's focus on updating of our knowledge updating of our technology you know how long we keep on giving permissions to the engineering colleges to set up new one when they don't have the proper facilities right so it says that you know we can review the decision of setting up of new engineering colleges every 2 years that is not a problem but we must also make it sure that we must come up with the traditional uh, we must go away with the traditional disciplines and come up with the new technologies it says that no new additional seats have to be approved in the traditional disciplines such as you know mechanical engineering civil engineering electronics no new uh, no new seats have to be additional seats have to be given for example if a college has been granted 120 seats sometimes the government gives them permission to increase it to 180 or 242 now that is a problem so they say that that's right that's right sumeda whatever you said is that's right exactly now so this is a problem that we have in engineering education in india so the committee has recommended something like this you know 
why to run behind this traditional you know traditional engineering disciplines let's focus on the coming up technologies let's focus on the technologies focus on you know having some undergraduate programs exclusively like we you know with the new fields such as artificial intelligence blockchain robotics cyber security this has some great scope in the coming generation so let's focus on that so these were the statements given and particularly the recommendations given by the committee I hope that is clear now moving on so coming to the artisans and you know some handloom industries so this particular industries generally you know india has some traditional uh, background with respect to the uh, this particular you know handloom industries and with respect to you know this area of uh, tradition artisans and all so we have definitely greater scope we have many artisans in the country but the problem is with the market we don't we are unable to provide the proper man, market for them isn't it so that is the problem we have with respect to this you know artisans and other areas so for that particular purpose government has launched a scheme called you know sphurti scheme it is s f u r t i so what is this sphurti it stands for scheme for fund for regeneration of the traditional industries so we'll focus on regenerating the traditional industries and here the traditional industries includes you know the handloom industries the coir industries the khadi so all these will be a part of this particular industries okay so this sphurti scheme is being implemented by the ministry of micro small and medium enterprises and what exactly they do here is so if you can see the artisans if we see that like, you know in a village there are different kind of artisans like this so it is not a problem like you know the problem is these people may not get the proper opportunities but in case if you make this village like this and make all of these as a part of a group as a cluster what is the difference what will be the advantage the advantage is that people till now who have not focused on individual now can focus on this cluster because it has a group now so they will be having much access to accessibility to this particular aspect right they will be having a better market and this particular market will lead them to the development and that may lead to the economic empowerment of these particular people also apart from that it will create employment for the future generations of that particular industry so why are we talking about this because recently the ministry of micro small and medium enterprises has approved 111 proposals of clusters under this particular sphurti scheme so that is the main reason okay so as part of this some financial assistance will be given by the government so there will be kinds of clusters for example if there is any cluster which is having more than 500 artisans a budget limit of rupees 5 crores has been allocated so where the government will be giving a amount of 5 crores for the development of that particular major clusters if that is a cluster with you know less than 500 artisans then they will be giving an amount of about you know 2.5 crores for their development and now someone has to look after you know how it how the cluster is working so there will be a steering committee which will be headed by the secretary of msme they will see what is the progress of the clusters and apart from that they have to give the information to the various stakeholders involved in it so uh, whatever the information that is present everything will be updated online so that we can effectively implement this particular clusters so that is about the sphurti scheme okay now how will they select these clusters now these clusters will be selected based on different kind of areas particularly the geographical concentration if you look into the different areas so different areas have different kind of things for example if you look into the state like assam they have muga silk muga industry right so every state so different different states has different kind of areas and you know based on that particular geographic location geographical concentration they will be forming this particular clusters okay apart from that there will be nodal agencies such as you know khadi and village industries commission and coir board so he will be looking after those particular those particular areas also okay now so these days we have been hearing some important cases with respect to you know farm loan waiver isn't it farm loan waiver has been a great topic which is you know often being discussed these days a lot so in order to put an end to this farm loan waiver and look after alternatives like you know if we can keep on demanding or de uh, like if we keep on depending on this particular farm loan waiver definitely that will hamper the economy that is a known fact 
So for that particular purpose, different states as well as central government is looking after coming up with some different kind of initiatives in the schemes. And one such scheme which was launched by the government of West Bengal is Krishi Krishak Bandhu scheme. Okay, this was launched by the government of West Bengal. So what will they do here? So as part of this, as part of this, per crop season, per every crop season, that is, you know, for uh, for Kharif as well as for Rabi, the government of West Bengal will provide them rupees 2,500 per crop, per acre. Okay, so if, we, if a farmer has an acre land, an amount of rupees 2,500 per a crop season will be given by the government. And if he wants... At, you know, if he wants both the amount at one time, that can also be done by giving, you know, 5,000 at a time also. Apart from that, apart from that, the West Bengal government will also give them insurance coverage of rupees 2 lakh in case, you know, whatever the issue is. In case if there is any, you know, by any circumstance, if there is a death of farmer happen. So any farmer who is aged between 18 to 60 years. They will be provided with a life insurance coverage also. An interesting thing is that they need not pay any premium. And this has come into effect from 1st of January. And there are some other schemes too when you talk about this kind of alternatives. And such schemes include, you know, the Raitubandhu scheme of Telangana. Raitubandhu scheme of Telangana. And then we have some other schemes like, you know, a Kalia scheme of Odisha. Kalia scheme of Odisha and then we have uh, other scheme you know which we will be discussing in the later part of our current affairs that is you know Bhavantar Bhuktan Yojana. So this is Bhavantar Bhuktan Yojana. This is by Madhya Pradesh. So uh, Raitu Bandhu and Kalia scheme both are almost similar but coming to the Bhavantar Bhuktan Yojana that is a different scheme. So what happens in this Bhavantar Bhuktan Yojana is that now generally government of India will be deciding the minimum support price, right? So based on this minimum support price, so there are case, there are some cases where, you know, the farmers were not able to sell their produce at the minimum support price, right? So in such cases, what they do is, they will see at what rate the farmer has sold and what is the MSP. So what is the difference amount in that if farmer has sold the produce at a less amount, the difference amount will be paid by the government of Madhya Pradesh to that particular farmer directly. So that is the you know, initiative of this Bhavantar Bhuktan Yojana scheme. Okay. So recently uh, it was in the news that, you know, uh, Niti Aayog has proposed uh, a proposal to the government of India with respect to, you know, area based income scheme. So this is nothing but it is a form of this Bhavantar Bhuktan Yojana itself. Okay. Now, moving further with the International Whaling Commission. So what is this International Whaling Commission? So across the world, there are some areas, you know, where we have, you know, high ab abundant of whales. And there are many countries, you know, which are depending on commercial whaling. So as part of the commercial whaling, they focus on, you know, killing of the whales, extracting the oil from the whales. And, you know, they'll be using the meat of the whales. So different kind of aspects will be done. So in order to put an end to all these kind of things, there was a body called, you know, International Whaling Commission. So as part of this, this is an international organization. It will look after exclusively for the conservation of the whales and how can we further enhance the development of the whaling industry. And what it has done is the innovative thing is that they have banned the commercial whaling in the year 1986. So in the whales, we have different kind of species too. But after 1986, they have banned the commercial whaling of this. And as of now, we have, you know, about 89 countries as the members of this International Whaling Commission. And of these 89, of these 89, India is also part of this. But the interesting thing that some countries have done is, you know, even though a part of this International Whaling Commission, so it means that, you know, it, they, they must stop the commercial whaling. But there have, there have been some kind of countries which have using a simple clause that is called as scientific research. So there are few countries, what they say is, we are not doing any kind of commercial whaling, but instead we are doing some kind of research on the whales, so we are killing it. That is the stance taken by some countries. And exclusively when you talk about this kind of, you know, commercial whaling, the countries which do the commercial whaling at huge levels is Japan, Iceland and Norway. So these are the three countries which they do a commercial whaling in a greater pace. 
so after that you know japan has also been advocating about the banning uh, stopping the banning of the whales and all but even now that has been continued and recently japan has announced that you know it will be going out of the the international whaling commission stating different kind of reasons because there are few communities in japan where they completely depend on this particular aspect of this uh, you know uh, like killing of the whales and depend on that particular area too so that is the other case okay so moving further i hope that so shall we go ahead i think everyone might have heard something about you know masala bonds isn't it masala bonds so we'll be discussing about a different kind of bonds today that is panda bonds so there is a difference between you know masala bonds and panda bonds by the end of the topic you are supposed to tell me what is the difference for between both of this okay now firstly i'll be dealing with the panda bonds and in the end i'll ask you what is the difference between masala bonds and the panda bonds okay so let's start with the panda bonds so what are these panda bonds so panda bonds are nothing but a kind of bond which are you know which are given or issued by a country which is non chinese so apart from china any country can issue them and these particular bonds will be sold in the markets of the china when these are sold in the markets of the china and the interesting thing is they will be raising the chinese renminbi here the currency of chinese will be raised through this particular bonds so what happens when these bonds are sold they can get much reserves of the chinese renminbi and this will be used by this particular you know people in the in their particular market so generally it will be sold by a non chinese and this is a chinese renminbi dominated bond for the first time it was issued in the year 2005 by both international finance corporation as well as asian development bank and why are we talking about this today because because the reason is recently pakistan has issued the panda bonds through this they want to raise some kind of loans isn't it so if we are issuing a bond in the other market and if we are raising the money which is nothing but a kind of you know uh, loans isn't it so through this pakistan wants to further enhance its reserves of chinese renminbi and use it for the development of this and they are expecting that you know the interest rate will be at about you know 5.5% so pakistan these days you know have been becoming very much closer to the country such as united states of america so after this happening no uh, as it is getting closer it is also focusing on having uh, replacing the us dollar with that of you know chinese renminbi also and apart from pakistan there was other country called philippines which have already raised about 1.46 billion dollars with an interest rate of 4.75% if you can look into this there is a difference between interest rate between philippines and you know pakistan the difference is simple the philippines when you compare that with the pakistan it has a better credit credit rating so that is the main reason it has been given at a lower interest rate where they have to pay the less interest than that of the pakistan so that is about this panda bonds now what is the difference between masala bonds and this panda bonds can anyone tell me what is the difference between both of these okay the thing is do anyone want to answer or can we go ahead the thing is through the masala bonds what exactly happens is indian companies indian companies will raise the money in the abroad markets here the country the india itself indian itself is raising the money from the abroad market and these are the rupee dominated bonds okay but coming to this coming to this panda bonds there are a different concept where the other country is raising the money in the chinese renminbi so that is the difference between both of these 
Moving further with the Indian Bridge Management System. So Indian Bridge Management System is a different concept which is you know very very important too. When you talk about the infrastructure, yes, yeah, that is right, that is right. So now when you talk about the in, uh, infrastructure, definitely you know roads, bridges, and everything has a great of concept with respect to the infrastructure development. And today we are going to discuss about Indian Bridge Management System. So we often hear different kind of cases with respect to you know failure of the bridges and few other things like that, isn't it? So now this Indian Bridge Management System is under the Ministry of Road Transport and Highways. And what is the objective of this? Is it will consist of the information of about you know lakhs of bridges at a single place. And through this particular through this particular you know uh, uh, inventory, when it have much access, it can get to know different kind of concepts like you know what is the situation of that particular bridge. And if, if that requires any kind of repair and if that is any emergency, so that can be done through this Indian bridge management system. But how can they do it? Yes, how can they identify that it needs some kind of repair? So here we'll be discussing about different kind of numbers in this Indian bridge management system. The first and the foremost one is about the unique identification number. Okay, this will be called as national identification number also. Okay, so every bridge like you know as of now every person has Aadhaar. So in a similar kind of thing, every bridge will be having a unique number. So if you can enter that particular number in this Indian bridge management system, you can get the details of that particular bridge. So that is the unique identification number, which is also called as a national identification number of a bridge. Okay. Now, so how will they identify that? So based on, on which area it is, whether it is in a state highway or a national highway, which RTO zone it falls into. So based on that, they'll be identifying this. And now, when you have this unique identification number of a bridge, we also want to know the location of it. So for that, we have a different number called bridge location number, which will be based on the GPS. So they'll be taking up the you know, latitudes and latitudes and longitudes of that particular bridge and they will locate that. You know, this is present in this particular location. They'll be giving the cords and that will be stored as the bridge location number. Now, so that is good. We have another aspect here that is other number called bridge classification number. Now, what is this bridge classification number? So the, the government will have complete details. What is the thing that have been used for the construction of that particular bridge? What are the engineering characteristics? So based on the characteristics they have used, they will be having a number called a bridge classification number. So based on all these numbers, based on all these numbers, like, you know, the unique identification number, as well as you know the location identification number and this one so the bridge classification number based on all this they will try to understand and they will rate the bridges as structural rating number and interestingly if that bridge has been of greater use for fishermen or any kind of people who are working or you know who are dependent on that particular bridge and it is leading to progress of socio-economic activity of different kind of people so they will be given a number called socio-economic bridge rating number also So this will be of greater help. This will be of greater help for identifying all these particular areas. So till now, this bridge, uh, this particular registry has about 1.7 lakh bridges and all these bridges will be checked before monsoon so that we can reduce the, you know, accidents that are happening with respect to the bridges and we can deal with them. So that is the main objective of this Indian bridge management system. Okay. Now moving with. Moving with the next concept that is Samvad with students. Now in India, we have different kind of people. For example, when you look into the children, if the children have some better awareness about the different concepts. So sometimes uh, they feel like, you know, if you ask them, what do you want to become? So they'll be answering different kind of aspects. And we often see like, you know, few people will be saying that I want to become a scientist or I want to become an astronaut. So some different kind of people will be telling that, right? So in order to look into those people who are who have some greater interest in the area of the space technology and others. So this particular, you know, ISRO has started a program called Samvad with students, where they will have some different discussions with that particular students, younger generations. And this was done recently at ISRO facility center, which is present in Bangalore. So through this, they will interact with various youngsters across the country and make them understand what are what is exactly the space science and what are the various activities they have been doing on 
and create a kind of you know science temperament in their particular minds okay now the inaugural event has happened where about you know 40 students and you know 10 teachers from different kind of schools have attended it and generally we often read so even many aspens also read like you know if we launch a satellite we just see you know this satellite has been launched and we just you know we just see what is the purpose of this but how many people the common man how many people go through what is the advantage of that particular you know launch of that particular satellite right so it makes it clear understanding to the students they must know what is the various programs that have been taken up by the isro for this and in which fields that will be of useful and how can we enhance that further so there will be different kind of sessions happening they will make the children understand you know how that can be done uh, like you know what is the use of that particular operation and how can we further enhance the utilization of this so there will be interaction with the scientists and engineers all will be done and this will in inspire the students to study well as well as you know get into the field of space technology so this is about the program called samvad with students Okay, so I'll be showing you a map now. So this particular map, can anyone identify uh, what exactly it indicates or which group it indicates? This particular map. Just a guess. Can anyone guess what exactly this group indicates? Any guesses? Okay, uh, Samuel says ADB. Okay. Okay, so if you can look into this, this includes ASEAN countries plus six. So now you get the hint. So it is including ASEAN plus six. ASEAN plus 6, it is not South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation. ASEAN plus 6 is the hint which I have given. It is ASEAN plus 6. So ASEAN plus 6 here indicates the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. You know, generally this this involves is a kind of agreement which is you know involving this ASEAN plus six countries. So I'm asking about the agreement. So which exactly it talks about? Got it? So regional comprehensive economic partnership, which is actually a proposed free trade agreement between the ASEAN countries and six other countries. Okay. So what are the ASEAN countries? We know that, and six uh, six countries here includes the Australia, China, India. Japan, South Korea and New Zealand. You can see here, right? Australia, China, India, J Japan, South Korea and New Zealand. These are the six countries apart from this 10 ASEAN countries. So they are proposing a free trade agreement. There has been actually different kind of aspects and there were many kind of discussions happen with respect to the same. But yes, they were unable to come to a conclusion even now. The negotiations for starting this kind of, you know, uh, the negotiations for this, uh, the negotiations for this have started uh, somewhere in the year 2012 and yet there were no conclusions yet reached but yes there were different kind of countries which have come together for making it much better and the negotiations were given that an end date will be you know 2019 that is the proposed end date for this regional comprehensive economic partnership so india thinks yes if we can deal with the regional comprehensive Econo economic partnership we can do uh, you know we can create a kind of market of msmes and integrate that with the different kind of asean plus six country and it will further enhance the export that is what india's proposal is but india is having a single fear that is about china because we already have some kind of you know trade deficit with china and if we further enter enters into the free trade agreement with china definitely you know they will be dumping many products into india that is what india is worrying about but recently china has expressed an interest to talks with you know to have a talk with india with respect to the regional comprehensive economic partnership so that we can come to the ending of a signing of a particular deal so that is the main reason we are discussing about this particular topic okay now 
so after the demonetization happened you know uh, people have been uh, you know looking after different kind of areas especially with respect to the digital payments isn't it the era of the digital payments has been started so a survey was launched by the reserve bank of india through this they want to understand what is the habit of the people with respect to the retail payments okay so it deals with the re retail payment habits of the people so as part of this the rbi wants to survey about 6000 individuals in six cities and they want to understand how the people have been doing different kind of aspects they will be coming up with you know some different kind of aspects like you know uh, in which cases the people have been using the digital payments and they will try to understand this area they will promote about you know this particular utilization of the digital payments based on the data they will be getting so that is just a small concept that is about a survey on the retail habits of the people so moving on with the most interesting as well as important topic that is assam accord you know assam accord uh, that is the most important concept and recently we have seen the issues of you know nrc and now the citizenship bill so there were many kind of issues going on and all these are in consonant with the assam accord so what exactly is this assam accord and why did they sign this so there is a small story behind this so there has been a greater influx of the illegal migrants into the state of assam where the indigenous people of assam thought that you know if there is a huge influx like this only that may lead to you know further deterioration of their own indigenous culture that is what they have thought and few people under the leadership of all assam students union and all assam gana sangram parishad they have started a movement they have started you know a movement and you know it was successful uh, in such a way that you know government of india uh, like you know has come to a conclusion to come towards and reach out to this particular people of assam and for that the government of india has called the leaders of the assam movement and in the year 1985 both the government of india as well as the leaders of the assam movement have signed an agreement that is called as assam accord the main objective of this is that you know they want those people the illegal immigrants have to be identified and they have to be expelled from the state of assam at the same time it also says it also put a compulsion on the government of india that they must to protect the assami culture they must protect the assami culture at the same time they have to provide some constitutional legislative as well as administrative safeguards to the local people of the state of assam so that is the main component of this assam accord and that was signed and yes government has said okay we will do it and that has led to the end of this assam agitation but when you talk about the assam accord in particular so there are three important points which we have to highlight so it says that they have been asking that you know any foreigner who has entered between the years of 1951 and 1961 they must be given full citizenship along with the right to vote okay now if that is between 1961 and 71 they must be denied voting rights for 10 years which means that after 10 years they can be given the voting rights they must be denied voting rights for 10 years but they would enjoy the rights of the citizenship but they will not be given that is between 61 and 71 but if with in case if they have entered assam after 71 they say that all these people have to be identified by the government of india and they have to be deported okay that is the purpose of this now after this so recently union government has approved a setting up of a high level committee for implementation of the clause 6 of assam accord but what exactly this clause 6 talks about so governments have been looking towards the different areas like you know foreigners entry and other things but most of the governments have not looked towards the clause 6 of assam accord where the clause says clearly that the government must provide the appropriate needs for example be the constitutional be the legislative as well as administrative standards that have to be provided to protect preserve and promote the culture of assam they have to protect the ling languages of assam they have to provide the language language identity and the heritage of assam people has to be protected so for that particular purpose the committee has been appointed which will have a wide range discussion with the different sections of the people and based on that they will be coming up with a conclusion and give the recommendation to the government of india so that is about the clause 6 now this is an interesting one too with respect to the international relations asia reassurance initiative act So this Asia Reassurance Initiative Act 
has been signed by the President of United States of America on 31st of December 2018. Now, what exactly it talks about? So it says that, you know, US has to greatly involve into the affairs of the Asia. It says that we must make use of US security. You know, US defense forces have to be used in order to protect the peace and order in the Asian continent and Asian region. And it will see there will be greater involvement of United States of America in Asia because there are some issues, for example, like, you know, Islamic State, which is definitely a threat to the America's existence. So it thinks that we have to put an end to this kind of thing. So for that particular purpose, we have to greatly involve the affairs of the Asia. So for that particular purpose, the Asia Reassurance Initiative Act has been passed by the United States government. It was signed by the President of United States of America. Through this, they will be spending about $1.5 billion for the different kind of programs in both East as well as, you know, Southeast Asia. And through this, they want to develop a kind of, you know, security and peace in the region. And here comes the uh, you know, uh, truth that is, you know, the important as well as contentious issue here is that U.S. said that will support Taiwan. U.S. will support Taiwan. And the U.S. Senate has made a request to the President of the United States of America stating that, you know, you must have and encourage some high-level visits to Taiwan. So whenever a country encourages high-level, uh, you know, visits in Taiwan, which makes it very clear that they are recognizing Taiwan as an independent one. Isn't it? But coming to the stand of, you know, China on Taiwan, that is a very different one. They think that, you know, China, uh, Taiwan is an integral part of China, but it is just separated by a water body. But Taiwan is a part of it. That is what said by the, you know, Chinese generally. So you think that, you know, we want to counter China. We want to counter China in South China Sea. At the same time, they're also involving in the affairs of the Taiwan. So which has hit the, you know, president of China. And he has made also a statement right after the president of the United States of America has signed an agreement, uh, signed this particular act. The president of China has made it very clear that, you know, Taiwan must and it will be united with China. Come whatever, the people of Taiwan has to accept that. And in case, if Taiwan is not able to accept that situation, we are ready to even use the force. That is what stated by the president of China to Taiwan. Now, will the Taiwan remain quiet? They say that they are not going to accept the, uh, you know, the uh, unification with China. And they also say that they are against the policy of one country, two systems. So they say that, you know, when you look into this form of governments in China and Taiwan, so uh, now China thinks that Taiwan is a part of, you know, uh, China and it always thinks that both of these are one country. But this way of administration is two systems. It says that Taiwan says we are not accepting that. But China says, yes, that is the policy we are now looking into. Okay, so China always considered Taiwan as... Now, moving ahead with the Parivesh Initiative. So Parivesh Initiative, we often hear, you know, different kind of states comes up with a single window industrial policies. Isn't it? So we often hear this kind of initiatives of the states that they are coming up with the industrial policies of their own. So what happens in a single window industrial policy? The thing that happens in a single window industrial policy is that the states will further ease the process of setting up of the businesses. So that is what happens in the single window policies of the state governments when you talk about the industries. But that is not the situation when you talk about the initiatives of the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change. Now they have come up with a policy of single window policy for environmental clearances that is called Parivesh Initiative. So Parivesh is nothing but proactive and responsive facilitation by interactive virtuous and environment single window hub so if a company wants to set up if a government wants to do something they need not you know again go to the different areas of the ministry of environment but instead just file a single application in the parivesh app, app you know parivesh portal and that they can you know submit them the, over there and they can monitor what is the status of that if they get the clearance that will also be updated to that single portal so that is the important of this Okay, it talks not just about, you know, uh, the environmental clearances, but also, you know, the forest, the wildlife or CRZ clearance, the coastal regulatory zone clearances. So what happens now? Earlier, 
Now, if if there is if there are two companies, you know, let us consider a company called A with a hundred crore investment, and let us company consider a company called B with just a ten lakh investment. So, when both of these apply for some kind of you know environmental clearances, definitely the government will give a preference to the company called A, isn't it? Now, earlier that used to be done because that was a manual process, but now when we are looking towards this Parivesh initiative, now whoever it is. the first come first service basis will be the principal so we can reduce the manual work and further enhance the cooperation of this particular you know companies and it may lead to the transparency also okay now the single window policy is that of course what exactly happens is you know uh, the companies need not reach out to the different kind of departments for the clearances of that particular you know business instead what they can do is they can just uh, submit their application with all required documents in a single portal and all the processing of that will be done with that particular portal only so they need not require to reach out to the different kind of departments rather than that it will be done only by a single process through the portal that's it that is a simple way of making the process now moving ahead with a paper kit to check the freshness of the milk so india is a country like you know where we mostly depend on the milk so we have uh, we we just know we don't have proper equipment actually to understand what is the freshness of the milk so in order to deal with that this is an important component when you talk about you know the technology aspect uh, so this uh, recently few scientists from iit gauhati has developed a paper kit so it it does not require any kind of you know equipment or huge equipment but instead it requires a paper kit so through this paper kit they will test how fresh is the milk is you know how fresh the milk is that will be done but how will they do it they will be using a smartphone and with the support of the smartphone they will be understanding that how can they do it so in the paper filled in the paper in the in this particular filter paper they will be putting some kind of you know chemical uh, you know chemical probes they will be very very minute we cannot see with our naked eye so what they do is they just put it into the milk so if there is any change of the color in that particular in that particular you know uh, milk so that color change will be photographed by the smartphone because it is connected with the smartphone application and based on that particular color standard so there will be some kind of color standards which are already predefined like if it get this kind of color this is the quality of this so based on that particular color we can understand the freshness of the milk so that was the invention by the iit scientist from iit gauhati so uh, that's all for today guys and we'll be back again on uh, so it's uh, like on third with the next uh, next part of the current affairs for the month of january and in case if you want to check any of these courses you can uh, you know look into my profile which is on an academy so download the an academy learning app you can you know get into the profile